Okay, we'll get this started. Um, I usually tend to go overtime, so I just want to start on time so that I don't go overtime. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to start with a prayer. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for bringing us together to learn about what you're passionate about, which is to make disciples of you. And I pray that you would teach us um, and that you would help us to learn more about you and what you're doing in this church and through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, thanks everybody for coming. I get less nervous when there's more people, so this is just the right amount of people. Um, yeah. yeah, I might take some um, films too for, for our church anniversary, so just don't mind me if I go like... Yeah, please smile and look natural. Let me know if you guys don't feel comfortable, <laughs> so I, I will not film you. <laughs> Here, film me right now. <laughs> I'll stand up and like do it like I'm really passionate and everybody just sleeping. That will be really <laughs> um, So for the next three Sundays from 12.15, hopefully 12.15 to 1.15, we're going to learn about um, what Bible teaches us about discipleship. So today's session is... Uh, discipleship according to Jesus. We're going to look, uh, take a look at how Jesus made disciples. And then next week, we're going to go into, so we're laying the foundation work today. And the next two weeks, we're going to talk about how we could implement discipleship in the church, especially in context of our church, Journey of Faith. And then the third session will be how to do it in family, with your children, and even amongst your peers and friends. So we're going to get into that. Um, I'm just going to throw some quotes at you guys to begin. It kind of gets our thoughts warmed up. <clears throat> and this is Dallas Willard. I don't know if you guys know Dallas Willard. Uh, Willard, you're familiar with his work. That's one of his most uh, well-known divine conspiracy. He said, discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. And then I put this up in my promo, uh, I think two weeks ago. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who wrote The Cost of Discipleship, he said, and this is the most strong statement that I could find, Christianity without discipleship is Christianity without Christ. It's pretty strong. And then my favorite, of course, you guys all know Tim Keller. Discipleship is not an option. Jesus says that if anyone would come after me, he must follow me. It's actually who we are. We are followers of Jesus, and that's what it means to be a disciple. That's what they're basically saying. So today we're looking at discipleship according to Jesus. So the thing that, of course, we're going to start with is what is a disciple, okay? Uh, the word disciple occurs in the Bible uh, 261 times. And it's only found in the Gospels and the Book of Acts. So only in those two books. I mean, five books, okay? And then the English word that is derived from the Latin word discipulus literally means pupil or learner. And the mathetes, which is the Greek, coiny Greek word for that, uh, they're pretty much the equivalent, the same usage, same meaning. But what's, what we're gonna notice here is, if there's a student, there's a learner, that means somebody's teaching, and somebody's uh, mentoring them. So the fact that there is a disciple means that there is a discipler. And that's just implied here in the word itself, okay? And so we're gonna, hopefully we'll see the meaning of discipleship unfold uh, as we examine how Jesus related to his disciples. And we're gonna look at that in many different aspects today. So in the eyes of Jesus, um, and we're gonna see some scripture later, but you guys probably seen a lot of scripture on how Jesus called his disciples and some of them who dis disqualify themselves by their own decision, um, you'll see that disciple in Jesus' eyes is someone who would answer his call to follow him at all costs. He simply said, follow me. And they abandoned their nets, they left their families, they left their homes, and they just followed him. That's what a disciple was. Uh, he was not concerned about their background or status. You could tell from some of the people that he had as his, his closest disciples. But their willingness to follow him, that's what counted the most. And what it means to follow, it means to go wherever he goes, or wherever he wants you to go. 
uh, and to do and see what he wants you to do and see. That's what a disciple does, at any cost, at all costs. Okay? And as you know, not everyone was ready to answer that call. Okay? Um, and just to, before we get to discipleship of Jesus, you're going to see that throughout the Bible, the concept of discipleship, having a learner and a teacher, that kind of relationship is seen throughout the Bible. Okay? So I put some examples up here, which is, you see that relationship with Moses and Joshua? Okay. You see it with even Naomi, as she mentors Ruth. Um, you see it with Samuel, with the first King Saul. And then you also see David having a very, almost like a bromance relationship with Jonathan. And then at the same time, he has a prophet named Nathan who confronts him as a king. But he confronts him even about his sin, the deepest sins, because he's the one who speaks on behalf of God. And so he had a relationship there. And then you have Elijah, one of the greatest prophets, mentoring another great prophet, Elisha. And then you got Jesus with his 12, and we're going to look into that today. And then you got Barnabas and Peter taking along John Mark, the one that Paul did not like in the beginning, because he did not go all the way with him. So he kind of, they kind of rubbed each other the wrong way, I don't know. Um, but then Paul took under him Timothy and Luke, okay, according to the Bible and history. Uh, but then nowhere in the Bible, the concept of discipleship prominent, more prominent, then in this verse that you know in Matthew 28, the Great Commission. So we're going to break this down, actually, before we begin. Okay. And these are Jesus' words. So we're going to look at this. The great, they call it the Great Commission. Um, it says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So this is the command that Jesus gave to his disciples after his resurrection. So we're going to break it down part by part. How this thing really is what he wants us to do, the key part of our mission as a church and as a believer. So the first word is therefore. So this word is perhaps the most underemphasized word in the entire Great Commission. Therefore. This is what gives the title Great Commission. This is what makes the commission great. Okay? Um, let me make my case. Here's the verse 18, the previous verse. It says, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And therefore, go make disciples of all nations. All of the authority has been given to me. For what purpose? For what task? To go make disciples. That's how powerful that is. That therefore is really big. One commission to go make disciples of all nations if the authority and the power of God is the driving force and the fuel, disciple making was the engine and the mechanism that accomplishes God's purpose on earth. This is the vehicle and the means by which God built his body, the church. Here's the next word, which is go. Three things are implied here. First thing is, Discipleship is not passive, it's active. You have to go. Discipleship does not happen automatically. It requires volition, it requires intentionality. You have to make a decision to go. And then what this word implies, lastly, and you'll see it in uh, Acts 1 8, we're going to look at that later. Or even now, um, discipleship requires planning and strategy. So I did not put it up there. It says, in, let me just read this here, Acts 1-8, it says, you will receive power 
when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. But I want you to wait for the Holy Spirit. And then I want you to start in your home city, Jerusalem. And then I want you to go to the place that you don't want anything to do with, which is Samaria. And then I want you to go to people that you think are dirty and you would not associate with because they're Gentiles. I want you to go to the ends of the earth. That's the plan. It requires volition on our part. It fights against our very grain of how we grew up, our culture. That's what they have to face in order to accomplish this great commission. And then it says to make disciples. Go make disciples. Um, I, brought a, I brought the book actually. Um, I started reading this book and I stopped because I could literally summarize the book for you in one sentence. <laughs> This is a book by um, Kyle Eidelman called Not a Fan. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this book. Um, let me just give you the quote that he bought. It's right here. Um, he said this. The biggest threat to the church today is fans who call themselves Christians but aren't actually interested in following Christ. And what is the threat? Um, if you find a church that is filled with fans, admirers, it's like somebody who goes to a concert, uh, just name somebody, I don't know, BTS or whoever you could think of, Taylor Swift, and then you're like, ah! and then the show's over, and then you pay your money, which is offering, you pay your money, saw the show, enjoyed it, and then you go home. You don't expect anything after that. You don't expect Taylor Swift to suddenly ask you to make some kind of sacrifice or to do something on her behalf. It's something that you go to, enjoy, hopefully, and then you go home and do your thing. That's what a fan does. And Jesus had lots of them, admirers. Um, if you find a church that is filled with fans, but little to no followers, you will, assert, you, will find that you will see a church where the minority of the people do the majority of the work, or all of the work. You will, search, you will find a church that lacks passion for worship and mission. You will see a church where pastors are burnt out and the leaders are burnt out. Why burnt out? It's because they're alone. Do you guys remember Elijah? Remember he had a major burnout? like after the greatest victory possible, he defeats all the false prophets. And everybody's like, okay, he's God. And then guess what he does? He runs away and goes into a cave and does not come out. And then what was his reason? I'm the only one left. Lord, I'm the only one left. It was not true. God said, no, there's 5,000 or 5,000 or 7,000 more. 7,000, right? You're not alone. But that's what he felt. That's why pastors and leaders eventually burn out. If the church is filled with just fans and no followers, there's nobody going with you. Going together, there's none of that. You're going alone. You're dragging dead bodies almost. They're like fighting it all the way. That's what happens to a church where there is no true discipleship. This is why Jesus was never interested in gathering fans. If you notice his life, his approach, you will never f find him catering to fans. He would actually almost try to turn them off. Fans can be great admirers. They would praise Jesus, Hosanna in the highest. And then just days later, they'll go crucify him. That's what fans do. When the object of their affection disappoints them. Um, they can memorize every lyric, you know every stat of their sports figure or singer. You can know the Bible in and out, know the history of who Jesus was, but there is no love for him. There is no, I will follow you at any cost. That's the difference between a fan 
and a follower. And Jesus wanted followers, even if it was just 12. Jesus focused on them because these are the ones who was going to build the church and bring in more disciples. And then it says, all nations. Just like I shared before, I just read that, Acts 1.8. Um, Jesus was calling his disciples to not only redeem Israel, but he was calling them for, for the purpose of redeeming the whole world, even people that they did not like. Samaritans, they did not associate with them. As far as Jewish people are concerned, they were idolater, idolaters. They betrayed them. They did betray their God. I don't want nothing to do with these people. Ninevites. Remember Jonah? I mean, he doesn't want he doesn't want them to be saved. Throw me in the ocean. Let me just die. I'd rather have just die together. I don't want to save them. Are you kidding? But God says, I have compassion on them. Just like you have compassion on your little shade that you have. You will be my witnesses in all of these places that you don't even want to go. But that's my plan. That's my calling for us, for you and I. That's what he's saying. And then he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. First, it's indicating the public pronouncement of one's allegiance to God the Father. I worship God. And Jewish people would not have a problem with this. Here's the second part that gets on another level, which is the person of Jesus. You have to acknowledge who he is. It's not just Yahweh God, Almighty God that we know from the Old Testament, but it's Jesus, the promised Messiah. Is he the Lord and the Savior of this world? You must recognize him for me. And it says in uh, Romans 6, 4, we were therefore buried with him through baptism in, into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. We are not just awakened people. We are born again people of God. According to this, we died with him. We have risen with him. There should be some kind of difference about us. Like, you know, that example that pastors always use, getting hit by a semi-truck, and if you tell somebody that I just got hit by a semi-truck, they should know, just looking at you, you know, you could tell. There should be something about us that shows to other people we have died and risen with Christ. And then lastly, it says, baptize them in the name of the Holy Spirit. It is an outward expression of the inward transformation that has taken place. That is why Jesus always emphasized the baptism of the Holy Spirit over the baptism of the water. So the one that John the Baptist gave, Jesus would always compare that and say, this is greater than the one that John gave. You must wait for this. Wait in the upper room and pray until he comes. Because water was just a symbol, the real thing, just a shadow of the real thing. <clears throat> and so this baptism of baptizing them in the name of the Holy Spirit, it emphasized that point. It's the Holy Spirit residing in us, empowering us to live the impossible. How can we love somebody that we hate? It's impossible. How can we share the good news? Like willingly do it ungrudgingly do it, gladly do it. We can't do it. Only the Holy Spirit can do it. And then, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. It talks about two things. First thing is the goal of discipleship. Mission of the church is more than just passing of the biblical knowledge. In fact, I learned from going to seminary, because I was surrounded by a bunch of seminary students, the bigger your head is, um, 
slower, it's, it's harder to move toward obedience. It's easier to argue. It's easier to show people how much better I know, like how much I have my theology down. But then it did not make me more humble. It did not give me passion to love Christ more. It actually made me feel like I have arrived. You're not talking about the literal side of the head. Right? Yeah, my head is big. <laughs> Little too. Yeah, that doesn't. Um, yeah. So pride, arrogance, yeah, spiritual arrogance. So. Just having biblical knowledge and having your theology, that's not the goal. And you guys all know that. The goal of discipleship is not only to pass on everything that Christ commanded, but to make sure that his teachings are put into practice, put into obedience, living what you preach. That is the hardest thing that I get confronted with whenever I look in the mirror. That's the hardest thing for the pastor, and I think you guys are the same. Everybody's the same. Every believer is the same. How can I live what I preach? Yeah, I have a, an older pastor friend. He constantly says, don't just be a hearer, but be a doer. It's over and over and over again. He says, that. be a hearer and doer of the word. Yeah. It's kind of simple and easy to remember. <laughs> yeah, you said it. And then the second point is the duration. Um, have you guys ever um, done short-term trips? How many of you have done short-term mission trips? I've done my share. Um, can you can you can we accomplish this in a short term mission trip? No. No. How long do you think it would take for for you to teach somebody to obey everything that Christ commanded us? Maybe a week, month, year? Years. How long do you think? Years. 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 If not a lifetime, right? For some? Yeah. This is the duration of discipleship. It's a call to lifelong mission, which is to live as a disciple and to make disciples. To teach them everything I've commanded. You cannot really teach somebody that you don't know, and you cannot teach somebody that you don't obey. Because there is no conviction, there is no power, right? So in order for you to have effective discipleship, this is a lifelong pursuit for me, and for the one I'm trying to reach out to. That's what that tells us. So what is the purpose of discipleship? Why do we do discipleship? Why did Jesus make disciples? What is the mission? Because everything comes with a mission. Every encounter with God, every calling leads to a mission. If I asked you, for example, this question, what is the reason why Jesus saved you? How would you answer that question? Why did Jesus save you? Well, probably a couple reasons. Yeah. To like save my soul, and then also to become a disciple, <clears throat> to spread his word all over the world. You got it? Right on the head? No. Yes? God so loved the world, he gave his only son, his love. Yep. So that we would be saved and know about his love, know about his person. So, what I expected you guys to say is to get us saved and give us eternal life, right? Now, my follow-up question would have been, because he answered the question so perfectly, I can't, my thing died. Um, but then, I would have said, well then, if the goal is eternal life with God, right? Why doesn't God just take us out the moment we get saved, right? Wouldn't that be nice? I mean, it's bad for my wife and my kid, but the moment I get, wouldn't that be perfect? Just go to heaven. Why do I have to stay here? Why do I have to put up with this world? Why do I have to get a job? And sweat and tears and suffering and all that. Sickness and all that. Because we have something to do. There's a reason why we're still left here. Because he has a reason for it. He has a mission for it. That's the only reason. And what's the reason? To bring others to experience the same thing that Jesus experienced now, which is to know God, to love God, and to have eternal life, and to have the Holy Spirit living inside you. Well, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. honestly, I actually had a chance to evangelize that thought to a Navajo guy. Yeah. This week, last week. Yeah. And 
couple of us guys were talking about Stephanie and goes, you know, all you Christians want to do is die and go be with God and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, we can't do that. And he looked really surprised. I'm like, isn't that your goal? I go, well, yeah, that's the goal for the world. But God told us we cannot do that. We have a purpose here. No. And it's super selfish. It, he had never thought of that or never got conveyed to him through witnessing other Christians. But no. That's a total no-no for us to want that. No. Surprised him to hear that. We have work to do, man. Amen. One of my kids uh, talked about that. I was like, I just want to go now. <laughs> you know, and it's weird when you hear a young person say, there's nothing more to my life. I, if I know I'm going to heaven, then I just want to go to heaven. And in a way, that's very positive. And I'm Which one? Which one? But the negative <laughs> stuff, no, the thing that we're explaining <laughs> to them, that we're here for the purpose of helping others get the same message and share that same thing. What's fascinating to me is that when we're done doing that, in my own opinion, God says, okay, you're ready to come home. You know, I don't know why Tim Keller was taken early, but for whatever reason, God said he did what he needed to do, and uh, he can come home. And my work will continue. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you're still quoting him, he died, but the work that he needed to do, he finished. So, in a way, I think that's, you know, just keep on keeping on until God says, okay, I'm taking you home. And the great point about this whole thing is, basically the main point about this, is that God wants us involved in his work. Can God just save everyone individually? Of course he can. Why does he need us to do it? He wants us involved in his work. You know, like we were sharing in um, the Lighthouse Life group the other day, how one of the pastors, Pastor Shin, shared that we don't have to serve, we get to serve. And that was a really good quote. Um, we have the privilege of serving on the God, doing the work that God is doing. He has called us to join in his work. It's like a father telling his son, I, I do that with my son sometimes, he goes, Daddy, can I help you with cooking? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's make pancakes together. And he loves doing it. And whenever I see him helping and just enjoying that process, it just warms my heart because it's relationship building. It's not only for the accomplishing the task of making pancakes. It's the fact that we're doing this together. And that's what God the Father wants out of us too, because we are his children. It's not a thing where you go, get this done, guys. You know what I mean? That's how I felt when I was serving at church sometimes. When I was serving the youth group, I have to, or they're gonna to go to hell, so I have to. I ha I'm supposed to. But no, we get to. Because that's how he saved me. So I get to share in his work what a privilege it is, if he calls us. And he calls every one of us. All the disciples, all the followers. Um, I think I'm on good pace here, so let's see. Purpose of discipleship. So here we go. Oh, this is the right slide. Yeah, what was his mission? So we're going to look at this uh, with this passage. Let me see if I lost my place here. Okay. Okay, let me go over the proclamation of the mission. So what is the mission? That's the topic that we're on. Okay, I'm on track. Um, so this is the first time Jesus declared why he was there, why he was here on earth. So this is the part where he goes to the synagogue and he's handed this Isaiah scroll and then he opens it to a certain part and then he reads this and then sits down and everybody just shocked that he read that. Okay, so in the Chosen series, the video series, the director added a line that says, I am the Lord Moses, made it more dramatic. Um, but it's not in the Bible, but anyway. So this is what he said. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now this verse, 
by prophet Isaiah was reserved for the coming Messiah. That's why people were shocked that he just read it and then he sat down. And then you know what he said? In your hearing, this is being fulfilled. Hello. <laughs> and everyone's like, should we stone him now? <laughs> and in the movie, in the series, they knew Jesus kind of like, oh, he's, just, he's the son of Joseph, the guy from Nazareth, son of the carpenter. Let him speak. You have to get permission to do that in the synagogue, right? So he knew some people. That he's, it's, I think it's a correct the way they did it. They did it. Um, and it's shocking that he said that. I'm the one. He proclaims the mission. What's the mission? I've come to proclaim the good news. That it is the time of Lord's favor. That he's going to save all of us. Restore. This is the reversal of the fall. Everything will be reversed. I'm making everything new. To set the oppressed free. Free from what? Sin and death. What is he offering? What's the good news? You will have eternal life. Life with God. Away from sin and death. <clears throat> you know something that jumps off of that at me? Yes. And a lot of you guys know I've been kind of obsessed with the Holy Spirit the last year or so. <laughs> This is Jesus talking, and he says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. Yeah. That's Jesus talking. Yeah. It's, it's coming more and more clear to me personally that the Holy Spirit's huge in our life. Huge. Yeah. He's, even Jesus is saying the Spirit of the Lord is on me. Yeah. I'm assuming he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I think that ought to be a prayer of all of us, because... I was praying with my wife, I was talking with my wife earlier, I think it was yesterday. I said, honey, you know what we really need? We just need the Holy Spirit to fill our lives. We know enough, we, we, we know what to do, it's just, when we do it in our power, there is no, there is no power. <laughs> Only when the Holy Spirit fills us, there is power. Um, so this is the message, very simple. I picked the simplest one, because everybody knows. For God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. He never gets old. I think if you're a believer, if you're a genuine follower of Jesus, this verse would burn in your heart every time you read. Because the Holy Spirit tells you, this is the mission. This is the heart of God. God so loved you that I sent my son to die for you so that you would have eternal life. I do not condemn. I came to save you. It's the year of the Lord's favor. That's the good news that we proclaim. That's why we can't hold it in. Despite our fears and weakness. Um, and then here's the acts of the mission. This is what Jesus did. He went through all the towns and villages, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore to send our workers into his harvest field. Um, we're going to break this down. This is the element, these are the elements of discipleship, how disciples are made. Okay. First, we need to proclaim the good news. The gospel message is core of what makes disciples. That's what saves us. We need the spirit to come inside us, we have to be born again. That is why our message must lead, begin and end with Christ crucified and Christ resurrected. You leave out Christ, then you don't have any message. Paul said, I consider it rubbish, dung, poop, any knowledge that is apart from knowledge of knowing Christ. 
So that's what he preached. Christ. It was interesting. Um, this is a study of the Bible. The word proclaim <laughs> is different than the word teach. Proclaim, so preach is the same thing. It's like a herald declaring this message. Teaching approaches the head, honestly, to dust go. But preaching is supposed to hit your heart. It's supposed to make you respond in some way. So that's great that that's what we're doing. We're no. not trying to teach them about the kingdom of God. We're supposed to share in excitement about the good news. Yeah. And then here's the second part, second element, was, which is the miracles, the wonders, right? Uh, is to, the purpose is to authenticate the message and the messenger, that he is the one. And so what he's saying is valid, okay? And there are other aspects of why Jesus did miracles, but this was definitely one of them. It's to authenticate the messenger and the message. Um, our message to our world, to our neighbors, to our friends, anybody that you try to witness to, must be backed by a display of God's power. The reason many do not come to know Christ is not because they have not heard or understood the basics of the message, it's the power of God that is not displayed in the life of those who deliver it. That's what I found out. Always, even now, every week, when I go in front of our youth kids, that's what I fear, that the Spirit of God will not use me. He will not display himself because of whatever I am. Like, please, Lord, act. Even now, here, right? Um, we tell others that God is love. But God's love is not displayed in our life. We don't really know how to love people. We don't know how to listen. We don't know how to look for signs or cues. Why are they like this? What are they struggling with? I'm, I was so horrible at it as a pastor. No wonder the, some of the kids didn't react reacting. Um, we say that Jesus is the way, truth and the life. And yet, we're constantly rolling our heads trying to find ways, come up with the best strategy to do things, when his thoughts and his wisdom is much higher than ours. We t tell others that Jesus died to save us, yet we are more excited and passionate about other things, anything but Jesus. You know, Francis Chan was a, I think it was a passion conference or one of the conferences, he was saying, you know, I was sitting in this coliseum and watching a basketball game. And I know how that is because every, you know, many of you have went to a real game, right? NBA game. It's like 30, 40, 50,000 people sitting there just cheering. And he's like, when you see that leather ball going through the metal rim and people just stand up and raise their hands and go wild. And then he said to the crowd, I think there were like 20, 30,000 people there. It seemed like a very loud crowd. I mean, big crowd. And he said, Imagine if there was a coliseum full of people who got that much excited about Jesus. Tongue in cheek. And then three second like awkward moment and everybody started shouting, right? Because they caught on. Like we're supposed to do that. <laughs> but what if we did that for real? What if that was reality in our hearts? I wish it was for mine. I feel sad that it isn't. <clears throat> And it makes me examine my own heart. What is my relationship with Jesus really like? Am I a true disciple? <clears throat> That's how the message is authenticated. And the, what's the motivation behind discipleship? It's that Jesus had compassion. It's a gut churning, the original meaning of that word, I shared it before in my message. It's a gut churning pain. He sees them as harassed and helpless. It's to, so calm is with, together, and then passion, pati or pasio, it literally means suffering. So passion of the Christ, the movie, it literally means the suffering of the Christ. That's what that is. So compassion is to suffer together or to suffer with somebody who, who suffers. To go inside of his shoes, to inside his heart and go, I feel the same pain that you feel. 
and I will stay with you in your pain until you come out of it. That's kind of the meaning of compassion. That's the same heart that Jesus had that motivated him to go to the cross, which he did not want to go to. It's not the pain of the cross. That's definitely horrible. But it's the separation from the Father that he did not want. Our love is strong. We're humans, right? We break over our loss, right? We're, we're heartbroken. Last night we were crying at 4 in the morning because of our twins. Because we could not forget. Human love is pretty strong. Then how much stronger would divine love be? Two persons of the Trinity, or three persons of the Trinity, how much stronger would they love each other? Even if it was just a moment of separation, Jesus would not want that. Because it's the most painful thing in the world. My God, my God. Instead of calling him Abba, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is the cry of his passion, his suffering. Why? I asked the same why when my twins died. Why? God, why would you take him? Why would you take them? I don't understand. Why would you do that? All I know is, Jesus did something even greater. He did it for all mankind. That's the passion of the Christ. And that's the motivation behind discipleship. Why do we want to disciple others, to bring others into his fold? It's because of this passion that Jesus had. And anybody who belongs to him, anybody who has the Holy Spirit, should share the same passion. We are his body. That's what is supposed to happen. And then here are the objects of discipleship. Um, there are two things mentioned here. First one is sheep without a shepherd. Uh, in John 10, 14, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. That's a pretty interesting statement, right? He knows the sheep, his sheep, and they know him as deeply as much as the Father knows the Son, and the Son knows the Father, and I lay my down my life for my sheep. Interesting statement. That's the object of his affection. That's his target audience. And then later in John 17, I skip around because there's so many verses here in between. This is him praying to the Father. For you granted your son authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. I have revealed you to those whom you, have get, whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. For I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believe that you sent me. I pray for them. I don't, I'm not praying for the world. I'm praying for them. Those you have given me, for they are yours. Why such emphasis? Of separation. Why my sheep? Why can't we every sheep? All the sheep in the world. Why them and then the world? I pray for them but I don't pray for these. What's the reason behind all this? And in the second part, Jesus likens it, discipleship, objects of it, as a harvest. He's telling his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So who's the harvest? Who's the target audience? Who's the objects? There's another passage that Jesus talks about where he talks about the harvest. It's found in Matthew 13. I'm just going to skim through this one because you guys know this passage. The parable of the weeds, the wheat and weeds, or wheat and tares. A man who sowed good seed in his field. The man did that. And then in the night, while he was sleeping, 
His enemy comes and sold weeds among the wheat and went away. And when his workers in the morning, well, a few days later, I guess, the, the wheat started to sprout. And so the owner's servants come to the owner and says, what should we do with the wheat? Should we pluck them out? And then this is what he says. No. Because while you're plucking the weeds out, I'm afraid that you might pull the wheat out also. Leave them alone until they grow to maturity. And then when the time comes for harvest, we'll collect the weeds and put them in the fire. We'll collect the wheat and then bring them into my barn. The water is given to both wheat and the weed. For whose sake? <clears throat> Why does he say don't pluck the weed? Leave it for the sake of the wheat. Because that's what he cares about. He does not care about the weeds. He's not concerned about the weeds. He's not catering to the weeds. It's all about for the safety and the growth and the maturity, the wholeness of the wheat. That's what his, his mind is on. That's the object. This kind of dichotomy, right? My sheep and the world and them and us. Um, this thing is seen all throughout the scripture, especially Jesus' teaching and ministry. Jesus embraced the weak and the destitute, but opposed the proud and the self-righteous. He had the harshest criticism for the Pharisees. The people who were looked up to as the men of God. And then the ones that nobody would hang out with, if they would just repent, he would embrace them. <clears throat> Jesus talks about separating the sheep from the goats in Matthew 25. Jesus distinguished between the children of the devil, which is strong, with the children of God. It also comes out in 1 John 3. When Jesus sends out his disciples, he says to them, I send you out as sheep among wolves. I don't think these are literal wolves. These are people. I send you guys out like sheep among wolves. And then some were qualified to be his disciples. And like I said earlier, others disqualify themselves by their own volition. Jesus gives them a choice. No, I want you to just come now. Forget your father. Forget your wealth. Give it up. Just follow me now. And they say, I can't. And we're going to dive deeper into this dichotomy in, in our next session. Uh, we're going to look at strategies doing discipleship within the church. Why targeting the wheat versus the weed versus the sheep and all that. How it plays into our discipleship strategy in, in our church. We're going to look deeper into that. And then the last part from this passage is, the sender of the discipler is the Lord of the harvest. You notice that the harvest is plentiful, workers are few. So you would imagine Jesus' next sentence to be, all right, go get them, guys, right? Go out there, get the harvest. No, he says, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. They might have been, right here, what do you mean? No, ask the Lord of the harvest. To send out workers. What kind of workers? Workers who know what they're doing. Workers who are prepared. Workers who follow directions. Ask the Lord of the harvest, the owner of the harvest, to send out proper workers. He's the one who hires the workers. It is the Lord of the harvest who readies us who sends us out to share the good news. He is the one who saves and disciples others through us. And our part is to seek and ask the Lord of the harvest. That's it. And to go out in obedience when he says, now you are ready and go. That's the picture. It's not our thing. It's not our harvest. He's the Lord of the harvest. And we're almost done. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so two things left. Process of discipleship. How disciples mature into disciples. We're going to look at this. There's five stages. 
Here's the first one. Observe. I do, you watch. So Jesus does, and the disciples watched as he preached on the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> For days on end. Do you remember how uh, Jesus got a hold of Peter? One of the first things that he did with Peter, do you guys remember? This is the moment where he got off the boat and says, I'm a sinner, I cannot go with you. You know, you cannot use me. You know what he asked Peter to do? He just said, can I use your boat? Can you just put them out into the water? Because there are crowds just coming at me, and I can't talk like this. Just put some distance on your boat. And guess where Peter was? On the boat. Imagine getting stuck in a service on a boat, and you don't know how long the preacher is going to go. Imagine that, guys. He's preaching for like three hours, and you have, you have no choice. You can't go, can we uh, go back for a break? You can't do that. It's Jesus. So you're sitting there listening to the whole sermon. No choice. Thank God it was Jesus preaching because apparently it got to him and he gets off the boat and goes, I'm a sinner, go away from me, Lord. And then he says, he picks him up off the ground and he goes, you're not going to be just a smelly fisherman. You're going to catch men. I'll make you fisher of men. Follow me. Peter. That's what made him follow. Jesus did his thing, and then Jesus simply watched in awe and amazed. Here's the next stage. Collaborate. I do, you help. I found this at Chosen, the, it's a great scene right there, feeding the 5,000. Can you just imagine? Jesus does the thing, free buffet for everyone, and everybody's praising God. It's like, He's the Messiah. Everything is in line. You know? God is real. He's the Messiah. We're hungry. Now we have food. Everything's perfect. And everybody's celebrating, including the disciples. Because he did it. Here you go. And then they did it. And it happened too. Collaboration. This is when you get excited to grow as a disciple. When you see God at work. Where? Through you. You thought God will never use you. But let me tell you right now, I always say, whenever I feel down, I remind myself, if God could use a donkey, I would prefer to use the other word, but I can't because it's church. If God could use a donkey, God could use you and me. God could use anybody. Third is evaluate. So you do, and I help. Now, Jesus sends out the disciples by two, and they encounter this boy possessed by a demon. And they've been doing pretty good. They're on a roll. They did the 5,000 thing, and they now healing demonized people, and they're doing good. And then they run into this boy. I don't know how many demons had, or what's his thing, but he had a powerful demon. He wouldn't come out. So all of these were puzzled. Maybe it was Judas Iscariot. I mean, you know, I don't know. Uh, so how come mine's not working? Um, so, yeah, that's another story for another day. Why nobody knew that Judas Iscariot was the one? Because even Judas Iscariot, Jesus used him. He did miracles, apparently, because they didn't know who it was, the betrayer. Anyways, this one, they're stuck, and then Jesus comes to them and goes, "Okay, let me teach you something. This kind of demon does not come out only except by prayer." So you have to pray, really pray. You cannot just do that and go. You know that Mark 9? Yes. It still puzzles me to this day that Jesus kind of yelled at him. Mm -hmm. He goes, how much longer must I put up with you? How much longer must I be with you? Yeah. Like, he's yelling at him. Like, you guys need to do something quick because I got to go. It's kind of how I... I'm going, so you guys gotta pick up where I left off. Is how I see that. Yeah. Well, you could change the tone of that and make it nicer. I can imagine. <laughs> Any of us. How much? Up. How much shall I put up with you? <laughs> it could be that version. It doesn't have to be like how much should I put up with you? Oh my gosh! Uh, any of us who have kids totally understand how Jesus responded. <laughs> what is wrong with you? 
Yeah. Don't like just automatically presume that Jesus would act like you would. Like just I, I give him a little bit more benefit of the doubt. Like he's Jesus, so he'd be nicer. I don't know. Um, he's encouraging. Though. Yeah, yeah. Come on, you guys. Yeah, it's it's possible. We were not there, so we don't know, right? Right. Um, it's just a fourth stage, which is delegate. You do, and then I watch. Jesus sends out two by two, and then later it's like seventy-two added. They do the same thing, and then what do they do? They come and report what they have seen and heard, and then they talk. But Jesus is not even there almost. He's just advising them from a distance. You do it, I'm just going to watch. Say a one thing or two. Mm -hmm. Right? And then we're back to phase one, which is repeat steps one to four with others. Now you are the disciple. Jesus said to his disciples, you will do even greater things than what I have done. Which is an amazing statement right there. How can we do something greater? It definitely is not talking about the death of Jesus on the cross. Because nobody can do that. <laughs> right? <laughs> nobody can do that. Only he can do that. What he's talking about is the, the, the mission. The accomplishing of the mission. More and more people coming to Christ. Coming to God. And having the spirit of God living inside them. And being converted. And it's becoming more and more. When Peter preached a sermon, 3,000 people came forward. You will do even greater things than these. And that's exactly what happened. Okay? And so we're going to end with this. Uh, I always find this interesting, how God multiplies. And it's, you could actually kind of trace it. Like, well, I could see that number game. Like, it's very interesting. So Jesus calls the 12. He starts with 12. <coughs> He says, go two by two. So it's a team of six, team of two in six teams. Goes out to share the gospel and to authenticate the message by doing the work of God, the miracles, right? And then later on in Luke 10, 1, just a chapter later, you see that there's 72 others who are appointed to do the same thing. So you got 72 plus the original 12, then you got 84, right? You divide that into two, how many teams are they? 42 teams, right? And let's say they go out, and each one, each team makes whatever, 12 disciples. That's what, what comes out to, 504. In 1 Corinthians 15, 6, it says, 500 plus people were present when Jesus appeared after the resurrection. And then you divide this number by two, team of two, twos, that's 250. And then you multiply it by 12, it comes up to 3,000, which is a number that they had convert, converted at the preaching of Peter. I don't believe that the picture is Peter is like have this great mic system like outside the amphitheater and they're blasting it and everybody hears what's going on. My picture is there's the first hundred people in front of Peter who heard it and pretty much all the other disciples, these teams of twos, or going around sharing the same thing. And they're counting the numbers. He accepted. Or I, I wouldn't even use the word accepted because it's not in the Bible. But he got saved. He got saved. And then they would tally. Came out to 3,000. I mean, it doesn't have to be this. But it's interesting to look at. Right? How God multiplies. And the last thing that we're going to share. Because I, I wanted to stop at... Um, where his resurrection, when he goes, ascends. And then next week, we're going to talk about the church. Um, when we think that this mission is too much, it's overwhelming. Just remember that it's not up to us. We depend on him. And that's why he said it at the last, at the end of his great commission. He says, I am surely with you always to the very end of the age. You're not going to be alone. I'll be with you always. Because this is important to me. This is my body. This is my past grief. So I hope that this, um, just seeing this picture, I hope that like just kind of gets you excited about discipling others around you, like even just your family members or your friends or anybody that you run into. Especially we have newcomers all the time coming in. What a great way, like God is just bringing people into our doors. 
and we could disciple them through our life groups. So let's just pray for that. Um, one, of, one of the things that's interesting, I know pastors and missionaries and evangelists say the same thing. If we all do our work, if we all lead two dozen, or even two, one be we, we should you know, evangelize everybody in, in one generation. So obviously someone here is not doing their work. You know, I mean that that's the idea. It's like it's obviously we know the multiplying process, but it's not happening. Yeah. God will do it. Pastor Derek, can I ask you to close this in? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Father, thank you for this time and thank you for a wonderful lesson. Oh, Lord, it gets us excited about what you want to do. And we know, Lord, one lesson, one message, one series, it doesn't matter. That's not it, but it's even just what this is saying, coming alongside and showing and following up and repeat um, is what will eventually make the difference. So help us to do that, this beginning process of discipling. And thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right, hope we bless you guys. Thanks for coming. Oh, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.